Welcome back to Metabolism of Fatty Acids and Triglycerides. So fatty acid requires transport into the mitochondria before beta oxidation could occur. This is the process by which fatty acid is broken down to produce energy. And the mitochondria, which is our powerhouse of the cell, produces a lot of the ATP and is the primary site for beta oxidation. Fatty acids are stored in the form of triglycerides inside these lipid droplets. When energy demand increases and you're exercising and need ATP, the stored triglycerides are then hydrolyzed into fatty acids and glycerol. With glycerol directly able to enter the glycolytic pathway and fatty acids need to be transported into the mitochondria for beta oxidation. So let's take a look at some of the key steps involved in transport into the mitochondria. So fatty acids with the coenzyme A, CoA, prime to charge up, creating fatty acyl CoA. The enzyme that we talked about is the acyl CoA synthetase. And the fatty acyl CoA combined to carnitine allows it to create into acyl carnitine. And this is then, with the help of an enzyme, carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1, CPT1, to move it in. There is another transporter that moves carnitine in. So in some patients, if there's a carnitine deficiency because they're not able to transport it in, you will also have an inability to process the fatty acids. The acyl carnitine then has the pass, it passes through the inner membrane of the mitochondrial space with another help of another enzyme called translocase. And then the acyl carnitine, you will then get reshuffled back into fatty acyl CoA and carnitine with another second isoform of the enzyme, carnitine palmitoyl transferase 2, CPT2. And fatty acids that have a chain length of about 12 carbons or fewer do not require carnitine for transport. On the right, you can see, this is an image showing you how do you get the fatty acid into the inner mitochondria space. In order to go past this inner membrane, it has to go through CPT1. So the acyl-CoA has to combine with carnitine, become acyl-carnitine, and that allows a pass into the translocase and goes right through. And then once it gets into the mitochondria matrix, the acyl carnitine gets reshuffled back and broken down into carnitine and acyl, -carn and acyl CoA. And then the acyl CoA goes to beta oxidation and the carnitine gets shuffled back out for recycling. So in this process, carnitine plays a very important role for the movement of fats to eventually lead into beta oxidation. Beta oxidation is a metabolic pathway that occurs in the mitochondria and is responsible for breaking down fatty acids to produce energy. Uh, during the beta oxidation, the beta carbon, which is the carbon-3, of the fatty acid is oxidized. This whole process involves a series of four enzymatic reactions that repeat until the entire fatty acid is broken down. Within each round of this reaction, two carbons are sliced off from the fatty acid chain, and that results in the creation of acetyl-CoA. You should know this compound from glycolysis, and as well as also two of the reduced forms of the coenzyme, which is FADH2, the flavin adenine dinucleotide, and NADH, which is these high electron carriers, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Then the acetyl-CoA has the passage to go right into the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle, and that can then further generate more NADH, FADH2, which is a crucial part to then powering the final electron transfer chain to make the bulk of the ATP. So in summary, the beta-oxidation fatty acids produce acetyl-CoA, NADH, FADH2, and then acetyl-CoA can be used for energy production in the citric acid cycle, while NADH and FADH2 are used to power the ETC. NADH provides the protons and electrons directly to the complex 1 in the ETC. FADH2 donates hydrogen and electrons to the ubiquinone complex. And on average, approximately 5 molecules of ATP are formed for each round of beta oxidation. And these are the key steps involved in this reaction. These are the key reactants and products in this key 4-step reaction. Acyl-CoA becomes enyl-CoA, becomes hydroxy-acyl-CoA, becomes keto-acyl-CoA, and eventually becomes acyl-CoA and acetyl-CoA. Over here, I have outlined the key enzymes. Acyl-CoA dehydrogenase is going to convert the first step reaction of acyl-CoA to enyl-CoA. Then we have the enyl-CoA hydratase, which will convert enyl-CoA to hydroxy-acyl-CoA. And then hydroxy-acyl-CoA dehydrogenase will then convert the hydroxy-acyl-CoA to keto-acyl-CoA, and the last one is a ketothiolase, which will convert ketoacyl-CoA down to acyl-CoA and acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA has a fate to go into the Krebs cycle, and acyl-CoA can be recleaved down back to another round of beta-oxidation. So just remember, it's a dehydrogenase, hydratase, dehydrogenase, and then ketothiolase. Focus on a disease. So medium-chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency, also known as MCAD, 
is a rare inherited metabolic disorder that causes the medium chain acylcholine dehydrogenase enzyme to be not present. As a result, it impedes the breakdown of fatty acids. Patients that have MCAD deficiency will have the enzyme activity reduced or absent. As a result, they have this problem in metabolizing medium chain fatty acids. Oftentimes, we'll be presented with hypoglycemia, the low energy production, energy depletion, and also suffer quite tremendously during fasting periods. This usually manifests in early infancy and early childhood. Severities could range from extreme lethargy, poor feeding, vomiting. In some cases, it might even cause liver dysfunction. Now, the management primarily is related to controlling the diet and specializing the higher meal frequencies and keeping that stability and maintaining blood sugar levels. Again, this is a pretty rare incidence is about one in 10,000. And this is an autosomal recessive where there's a single mutation which comes constitutes for 90% of the cases. Now let's talk about the special fatty acid chains or also known as odd chains. Odd chain fatty acids are the ones that don't have the odd number of carbons. And these are specific type of fatty acids that have the process a little bit differently. Uh, unlike even chains, which produce acetyl-CoA, most of the odd chains are going to produce the byproduct of propionyl-CoA. It's a very close relative to the acetyl-CoA compound. Uh, during beta oxidation of odd chain fatty acids, the final round of this pathway produces a three carbon fragment, also known as propionyl CoA. And propionyl CoA cannot directly enter the citric acid cycle like acetyl CoA can, uh, but instead it is used as a substrate for gluconeogenesis. So it still does provide some energy uh, functions. Gluconeogenesis is that quick process of taking sugar, glucose, and synthesized from non types of carbohydrate sources like amino acids, lactate, glycerol. It happens primarily in the liver or kidneys. Propionyl CoA is converted then eventually to succinyl CoA. And then through another series of reactions, is that succinyl CoA can then enter into the citric acid cycle. So the intersection is still the citric acid cycle, but the propionyl CoA that comes from the odd chain fatty acids provides another source of carbon, basically, it gives you another carbon to add into creating energy. So it should be noted that these unsaturated fatty acids may require modification to their double bonds. For example, the omega oxidation happens primarily in the microsomal region in the endoplasmic reticulum, and they will then produce a byproduct of dicarboxylic acids. And alpha oxidation happens in the peroxisomes organelle, and these ones will oxidize carbon two, the alpha carbon, and release one as CO2. So there's slight variation in the byproducts that these different kinds of fatty acids will produce. For example, beta oxidation, this is the one where the H2O2, hydrogen peroxide, produces this following protein and it can catalyze fatty acids chains up to 20 carbon length. So here's a quick overview of the key steps involved in all-chain fatty acids. So all-chain fatty acids produce propionyl-CoA instead of acetyl-CoA. And then the propionyl-CoA is then fed into gluconeogenesis. So here are the key reactions involved. Propionyl-CoA becomes methylmalonyl-CoA with the help of an enzyme called propionyl-CoA carboxylase, PCC. And this enzyme does require a cofactor of biotin biotin which is vitamin b7 and then demethylmalonyl coa gets rearranged into the methylmalonyl coa then the demethylmalonyl coa becomes an isoform of l methylmalonyl coa with another enzyme called methylmalonyl coa racemase and then the last reaction is a key reaction of l methylmalonyl coa to succinyl coa and this one uses methylmalonyl coa mutase and it does also require a vitamin b12 Steps number one and three require vitamins. And these are key steps of why taking vitamins play a very important role for creating energy. Here on the bottom is a reaction shown. Take a look at it, but you should be aware because when you do have a problem, a deficiency with PCC, the patients can result in acidemia and that can cause changes to the urine as a result of manifestation, usually in the inborn metabolic disorders. So excess fatty acids will turn into ketone bodies. Uh, this happens inside the liver where the fatty acids can be converted into ketone bodies. And ketone bodies are the three following compounds, acetoacetate, beta-hydroxybutyrate, BHB, and acetone. In this story, we're not going to focus on acetone because that gets dissipated through your lungs. So we're going to focus on acetoacetate and BHB. These are both very biologically important. Acetyl-CoA and succinyl-CoA will be converted into acetyl-CoA and then it becomes acetoacetate and eventually becomes BHB. BHB can cross the blood-brain barrier to provide energy for the CNS. Beta oxidation as a process is a much less regulated pathway than glycolysis 
but beta oxidation still produces the NADH, FADH2, and it may also turn off the TCA's activity because TCA's activity is also to produce NADH, FADH2. So when your body has plenty of energy, it will slowly downregulate. So this process of ketosis is going to be started with acetyl, acetyl-CoA going to 3-hydroxy methyl coa This enzyme is called HMG-CoA synthase, which is also known as hydroxy methyl coa synthase. And this is a key step in the reaction. As fatty acids come in, acetyl-CoA comes in, beta oxidation, it can become acetyl-acetyl-CoA. And that acetyl-acetyl-CoA will then be turned into HMG-CoA, which will then eventually become acetoacetate and acetyl-CoA. And the cycle can repeat itself, and one more reaction down from acetoacetate, it becomes hydroxybutyrate. And this is BHB. So these are the ketone bodies as a result of only having fasting or utilizing only fat-based compounds for energy sources. The acetylcholate will be used to make energy, so it can sustain NADH and ATP, and acetoacetate and BHB can be used for different types of tissues like your brain for energy. In the process of ketosis, the previous step that I mentioned, going from acetoacetyl-CoA to HMG-CoA is the rate limiting step. This enzyme can be induced by fasting, taking in copious amounts of dietary fat and glucagon and insulin deficiencies. So here is a visual showing you the fates of fatty acids and the acetyl coenzyme in the liver. So after a big carbohydrate rich meal in the letter A, you can see that from the lipoprotein lipase LPL, it's gonna take in the fatty acids and fatty acids can convert it into acyl-CoA with the priming step. Acyl-CoA has the opportunity to become triglycerides and eventually be shuffled out as VLDL, or it can go into the mitochondria with the carnitine and goes through beta oxidation, eventually leading to acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA can lead into ketone bodies for the body to use, and also some of it can also become into the TCA crypt cycle for energy reduction. Over here on the body, on the bottom, B as well, during fasting states when you're not eating, the body will then take into the adipose tissue and utilizing the hormone-sensitive lipase, break down fatty acids, and again, the fate is also uh, the same. So this is how your body sustains the fatty acid usage and turning that into energy inside your cells. So whether you are fasted, you'll tap into the fat reserve, or if you are taking in or fat from extrahepatic tissues or after eating a big, rich carb meal. Fatty acid synthesis from acetylcholine. So glucose can be converted into acetylcholine, which serves as a precursor for fatty acid synthesis. This conversion occurs through a series of enzymatic reactions with glucose being metabolized through glycolysis and that results in pyruvate and eventually further process into acetylcholate. Once acetylcholate is formed, it can enter the fatty acid pathway like we mentioned and be transformed into different kinds of fatty acids. Triglycerides, which are the dominant storage form of fats, is going to be synthesized in certain types of tissues like adipose, liver, and also the lactating mammary glands. Those are three key areas of a lot of triglycerides. Adipose tissue is responsible for synthesizing the triglycerides that are stored within the fat cells for later usage. For females that are lactating, the mammary glands and produce and secrete triglycerides into the breast milk for the infants. And the liver also plays a vital role for metabolism. It generally will export it as a form called VLDL, the very low density lipoprotein, which carries the triglycerides within the liver and delivers it to different tissues. So this is basically the bad LDL. Uh, bad cholesterol. And then the process of fatty acid biosynthesis, when we're building it up, acetylcholate gets converted into malonyl-CoA by the enzyme acetylcholate carboxylase. This is also known as ACC for short. Malonyl-CoA is important for building the fatty acid synthesis to elongate it into fatty acids. So fats are very dynamic. They can get broken down and built up when needed. Uh, the fatty acid biosynthesis reaction does require biotin, so vitamin B7, and also malonyl-CoA cannot be used in other metabolic pathways, so this is strictly only used for the synthesis of fatty acid. Over here, I have the reaction acetyl-CoA with the help of ACC and biotin will then become malonyl-CoA. The cytoplasmic fatty acid synthase complex is a multi-enzyme complex responsible for the synthesis of fatty acids inside the cytoplasm of our cells. Constitutes of a dimer, which means that there's two identical polypeptide proteins. This complex contains diverse enzymatic reactions that are used for fatty acid synthesis or the buildup. Within the complex, there are two very important sulfyl hydro groups that we'll talk about. The first part is a cysteine side chain, which involves a catalytic function of the complex. And this cysteine is able to contain a sulfyl hydro group, which is S bound to an H. 
and its main role is to transfer the acetyl and the malonyl units during the fatty acid. The second sulfyl hydro group that we'll talk about is called the phosphopentathenine chain. And this is a small molecule that basically comes from coenzyme A, and it acts as a flexible binding switch that allows the catalytic sites of the complex to facilitate transfers of different intermediates. So these are the machinery, if you will, for this big enzyme complex. The cytoplasmic fatty acid synthase complex is a highly coordinated system that operates to interact with multi-enzymatic activities on the same polypeptide chain. It's very unique in the presence of those sulfyl hydro groups, like the cysteine and the phosphopentathenine chain, allows it to be very efficient. Uh, it goes through two reductive reactions to require NADPH usage. Um, the transfer of a malonyl group occurs at the phosphopentathenine, and then this reaction repeats until 16 carbons of length is built. So it glues and builds it up. The most common one that the complex will produce is called palmitate. This is a 16 carbon fatty acid, but it can get up to either 24 or even 26 carbons with the range of C16 to C18 being the most common length. And the mitochondria system does prefer that range of carbons to use. So here's a visual showing you the, the fatty acid synthase complex. Uh, it will basically go through steps uh, utilizing transferring the malonyl and acetyl groups, building it up so it elongates the fatty acid chain. It does have a series of steps that utilize the NADPH as shown here. There's a ketoacyl reductase step and there's also an annual reductase step. And both of these steps require the NADPH. Eventually another translocation step and eventually builds up to become a C16C18 length fatty acid. So acetylcholate is a central molecule in cellular metabolism, and it's primarily produced inside the mitochondria through these metabolic pathways that we talked about, the oxidation of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. However, acetylcholate itself is also highly regulated, it cannot cross the inner mitochondrial membrane to enter back out to the cytoplasm. So in order for us to transfer acetylcholate, from the mitochondria to the cytoplasm and it has to go through several conversions and first acetylcholate is converted into citrate which is the building block and starting compound for the citric acid cycle the six carbon molecule and then this conversion is catalyzed by an enzyme known as citrate synthase then after the by citrus synthase and then once it gets inside a plasm the citrate gets converted back into the acetylcholate and oxaloacetate via another enzyme called atp citrate lyase and now acetylcholate can be further utilized by various metabolic processes, including synthesis of fatty acids. So this conversion of acetylcholate to citrate and subsequent reconversion back provides a means of transporting acetylcholate from the inner mitochondrial membrane to allow for it to be used in the cytoplasm. This is a key reaction. So going from the acetylcholate to citrate and citrate back into acetylcholate and oxaloacetate. So this two step is super important because this is how you would be able to transport the compounds inside mitochondria back out to the cytoplasm. Notice that the oxaloacetate will then have the fate of becoming either malate and eventually pyruvate, and this will then be used to be fed back into mitochondria for energy. So there's this recycling process that occurs. In both steps of oxaloacetate to malate and malate to pyruvate, it will require the usage of protons and electrons. The NADH will be reduced down into the NAD positive and vice versa, and also NADP positive will become NADPA. These compounds can be used to feed into the fatty synthase complex to generate more palmitate. So as you can see, there is a very nice interaction between different reactions to allow you to either build up the fatty acids or recycle compounds for using of other sources of energy.